Welcome everybody. Uh, it's good to see everyone. I know it's probably some of you are going to be probably coming in the next couple of minutes as we go from Zoom call that ends right on the hour and then, you know, some folks have to get a glass of water and that takes two or three minutes to plug in by five after. So, um, very excited to see everybody um, uh, continuing our information exchange uh, series. Um, very excited to be looking at elevating the youth voice. Uh, and we're also very excited to be partnering uh, with a longtime national um, colleagues and organization that we've worked closely with for many years, Youth Move, um, who are bringing their expertise uh, to us to help us with the work that you all are doing in your states. So um, I'd like to introduce uh, uh, our two presenters today. We're very happy to have them, very excited to have them. Shane McDonald is a youth program specialist at Youth Move, at where they work on implementation of the Youth Move Change Initiative, uh, which strives to create a pathway for BIPOC and LGBTQ2S plus youth uh, to enter peer support workforce. Um, they also are a member of the Youth Move Peer Center staff, where they advise on projects and products providing training technical assistance and coaching on youth culture engagement uh, in underrepresented populations. So important in today's settings, is it not? Shane is also heavily involved in, in the design, implementation, and evaluation of youth peer support programs, which I think you're gonna hear a lot about today. Uh, as a person with lived experience, Shane is invested in education and advocacy regarding the effects of systemic oppression and trauma on the LGBTQ2S plus community. Welcome, Shane. Also very excited to have Lydia Pru, um, who is a youth program coordinator at Youth Move National uh, and provides technical assistance to providers, communities, and organizations in implementing trauma-informed models of youth engagement. Again, so critically important. Uh, they serve as a technical service provider for SAMHSA funded systems of care grantees, uh, which many of your states work with, facilitates and co-chairs Youth Moves Youth Best Practice Committee and Youth Peer Support Subcommittee, and acts as a primary developer of Youth Moves Youth Peer Support Resources, training and curricula, of which I think you're gonna see some today of, of the things that, that Lydia and Shane do. Um, Lydia has been recognized by the Massachusetts Department of Mental Health multiple times for their advocacy and outreach work and has contributed to number, numerous presentations and publications on the youth voice and engagement. Shane, Lydia, welcome. We're so excited to have you and we will turn it to you to start your presentation. Thank you so much, David. And thank you everyone for being here. I'm just gonna throw up my uh, slideshow. Uh, if technology serves me well, which I'm hoping it does today. Um, I imagine folks can see my screen okay. That's good. Sweet. Thanks, y'all. All right. Um, so again, hello and welcome, everyone. Um, it's so wonderful to be here. Um, and I just want to say it's been such a pleasure to be able to both read um, and to hear um, all about the wonderful work that y'all have been doing um, across the country, really inspiring work. Um, and Lydia and I are also both excited to hopefully be able to offer some additional support uh, to y'all as well. Uh, so we'll introduce ourselves more in just a moment. Um, but my name is Shane, uh, and we are here today to share with you all um, a little bit about who we are and what we do as an organization, um, an overview of some of the youth engagement strategies we use, uh, and some considerations from our knowledge and experience around virtual engagement, uh, as well as the crisis continuum and 988, which obviously um, are major areas of focus for y'all as grantees. Um, I will say also uh, that Lydia and I have blocked off some availability on our calendars and offered it um, to folks to offer to y'all um, in order to schedule individual uh, calls with us. So um, if you're looking for more intensive TA and support, uh, and that's something that, that interests you, uh, we're excited to connect with you more after today. And I believe um, there'll be a link in the chat for folks to schedule. Thank you, Leah. Uh, awesome. 
So moving on, thank you, David, already for giving um, some more elaborate introductions than I was actually planning to do for myself today. Um, but I will just reiterate, my name is Shane McDonald. Uh, my pronouns are they, them, and theirs, and I am a youth program specialist with Youth Move National. Um, I've been on the team for just over a year now. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, and as David mentioned, my main areas of focus have been um, on our Youth Move Change initiative, as well as providing support through our peer center, both of which I promise uh, we'll dig into a little bit more today. Um, but Lydia, if you'd like to reintroduce yourself or add any other sort of tidbits, um, feel free. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, again, my name is Lydia. I use they, them pronouns. I'm located in Worcester, Massachusetts. Shan and I are both in Massachusetts. Um, we're very pleased with the weather today. Uh, I've been at Youth Move National for around four years, and prior to that was the Youth Program Manager of Youth Move Massachusetts. Youth Move Massachusetts focuses largely on very low barrier community-based youth peer support that serves young people across systems, young people who haven't been identified yet as needing system support. Um, there's a lot of pizza involved. So a lot of, uh, a lot of youth work on the ground in a very low barrier community setting. Uh, my personal lived experience background is largely in mental health and needing support in education as well as disability. Thank you, Lydia. Um, now, uh, just to give you a little bit of context about who we are and what we do as an organization for folks that may not be as familiar with us, uh, Youth Move National is, of course, a national youth-driven organization devoted to improving youth-serving programs and systems by uniting the voices of individuals who have lived or firsthand experience moving through these systems, uh, which include the mental health system, juvenile justice system, child welfare, education, uh, and other systems actively serving youth. Um, also, if you notice, I'm trying to mindfully slow down for the folks doing our subtitles. I apologize just as a person, and I think it's a Massachusetts thing too, Lydia, correct me if I'm wrong, often talk a little bit fast, so I'm trying to slow myself down a little bit. <laughs> um, with that being said, um, in line with our mission, Youth Move standing for youth motivating others through voices of experience, uh, we have united to utilize our experiences and skill sets to affect positive change through uh, several means, youth advocacy, youth leadership development, youth engagement in change management and implementation, providing training, technical assistance, and consultation, uh, youth adult partnership and leadership trainings and guidance, youth and youth track conference planning and delivery, uh, distance and peer learning around youth engagement, uh, and a uh, major one, chapter development. Uh, so Youth Move National's chapter network consists, I believe currently, at over 70 chapters across the country uh, where young leaders are working in their local communities, trying to advocate uh, and to provide leadership opportunities for young people to be involved in decisions and efforts uh, that impact them in their lives. So this allows for cross-system, cross-cultural, um, as well as varied geographical representation of youth voice uh, and experience across our efforts. Uh, and I will say, although we don't have chapters in all states um, in the US, we have them in many. So I definitely encourage y'all to go to our website at youthmovenational.org. Um, we do have a page where you can search um, by your location. Um, and it also has a list of all 50 states um, and, and notes uh, which states have chapters and also links to their additional websites um, or more information on them. So if you're looking to connect um, with one of our chapters at a more local level, we definitely encourage you um, to look us up. And then lastly, sort of setting the foundation why we do this work, right? So Youth Move National envisions a future in which young people are valued as empowered leaders, advocates, and designers of communities that are built for all youth to thrive, right? So a future in which young people are no longer treated as numbers, problems, or caseloads, but as humans whose struggles, perspectives, and leadership are both important and imperative to informing meaningful community and systems change. So that's us. That's Youth Move National. Lydia, did you want to add something? 
Oh no, I was just preparing to come up oh. for the next slide. Sorry. <laughs> no, I'm really so excited good. to be here. <laughs> <laughs> as well as uh, um, take it away, friend. All right. So when we consider our foundations of youth engagement, these are a couple of frameworks and tools, definitions that we use. So the first one being when we're talking about youth engagement, to understand that youth engagement is a strategy, right? It's a series of activities and things you're doing. Youth engagement is a strategy where young people have a meaningful voice, a meaningful role, and they're authentically involved in working towards whatever change, program development, community development, leadership, et cetera, y'all are working on. It's particularly those systems that directly affect their lives, right? I don't think any of us really love it when outside forces and systems control parts of our lives and we didn't get a say in that. So same thing totally goes for young people. When considering youth voice and its value, right, research shows that um, young people, patients, and their families who actively engage uh, for and with their healthcare teams have better outcomes. We see this kind of pattern across systems. Another great example is that in child welfare, um, if families and young people are involved in the mandated reporting process, those families and youth have a much better uh, chance at positive outcomes or positive at least interaction with that system because they were informed, engaged, and involved in that process that involved them. Um, many times, uh, often, uh, young people choose less expensive options when participating in shared decision-making and express greater satisfaction with their healthcare experience. Uh, the Center for Adv Advancing Health Report here to stay, what healthcare leaders, uh, I believe that's supposed to say what healthcare leaders say about engagement. Um, one, engagement is a verb, right? It's active. It's a two-way street. There's lots of things happening. There's lots of moving parts. The healthcare system doesn't make engagement easy. Um, I mean, I'm, a, I'm in my 30s. I have all this experience with advocacy and systems and working with all sorts of state departments. Um, it took me three months to find a provider who would simply support some documentation for accommodations for school. Like that's that's a long time for someone who has all these skills, never mind if you're just new to a system, particularly healthcare. Everyone benefits from engagement. We know that the young people who are engaged, the staff providers that are engaged in that work, as well as the wider community and organization are those that are going to um, benefit. They're gonna be benefits for each of them. Engagement is demanding and many are unprepared for this work, right? Well, often uh, folks will say, well, we'll start a youth advisory board. Okay, but who's gonna recruit those young people? Who's gonna coach staff on how to interact with young people in a professional and helpful way? Who's gonna coach and support youth learning how to operate and work in sort of a more formal professional environment or system? Who's gonna keep notes? Who's gonna email those notes out? Um, who's gonna make the calendar connections? All those kinds of things. It is a lot of time. It's a lot of work. And so we wanna make sure that while, um, you know, our eyes are wide and we're really excited about youth engagement that we're prepared uh, logistically and technically for that work too. Uh, and partnerships are required. Your agency, you yourself, will not be able to do 100% of this work. Similarly, one young person, two young people won't be able to do all of the youth engagement with you that you need, right? Um, connecting to your youth-run organizations, your family-run organizations and programs, your local chapters, Places like the library, the YMCA, local cafes, right? All of these kinds of sectors of our lives and these systems, all these partnerships are required in order to really um, embed youth voice in the work that we are doing. So one tool that we use when we're thinking about how we're doing this work, right, is Lofquist's spectrum of attitudes. Um, this is really central, right, to positive youth development, PYD. If you've heard or read about that, youth.gov has some great resources on this as well. But when we're considering youth engagement in your planning, the day-to-day -day operations, the evaluations and continuous quality improvement or CQI, we talk about sort of three um, prepositions. I was reminded recently that these are prepositions, not verbs, um, by a young person who reminded me that they're prepositions, not verbs. So the first thing, right, is that youth are objects, right? We are creating something and we're delivering it to them. Um, you know, we are doing this, we're providing healthcare to you, right? You go to the doctor, you don't really have a say in that design, what the room looks like, all those sorts of things. This is being done to you. Youth are recipients. We may design a service or a program and then 
have it be ready for them, right? Like I created this youth group space. I've got an agenda ready. I ordered some pizza. All right, youth, come on in. I did this for you. And then the third style that we're really looking for with, um, we're looking for this as much as possible, right? Understanding that different agencies, systems have limitations on how and where you can interact with young people. But we wanna really aim for where youth are resources, youth are collaborators. We are accomplices alongside one another in this work, right? We're doing the work with one another. And so really we wanna be as this blue column over to the right. When we think about the goals, the practices, and sort of the secondary, um, what are those consequences or byproducts that these styles um, have, right? We see all the way to the left with the yellow, right? The goal is we want these young people to grow. We want these young people to get something out of it. In practice, day to day, it looks like adults are in control and there's no intention of youth involvement. This does not mean there's malice, right? Or that there's the intent of harm. It just means that this is something being provided to or done to young youth and young adults. Um, and the byproduct, right? is conformity of young people and acceptance of that program as it is. Um, a good example of this is like your traditional K through 12 school system, right? The school system largely was designed without young people's input, right? How we do school in the United States. Um, but the goal is like, get some knowledge, make some friends, you know, build a bit of a network, learn from folks. Adults designed it, no young people were involved in sort of that design and implementation. And young people learn how to go to school, how to do those things. And typically, more and more now, I think we're seeing challenges up against after COVID, how we operate sort of the school and education systems. But largely, right, we go to school, we get used to it, we go for 12 years, and then possibly higher ed. Whereas like when we kind of get through the green into the blue side of the spectrum, right, our goal shifts from the personal growth of young people to increased organizational effectiveness, right? We want our work to be done. We want it to be done well. I don't think any of you want to be recreating the wheel a hundred times to get it right, you know, for what young people will engage with. We want this to go smoothly. We want to get the right thing done first. So in practice, this means that there is youth and adult partnership, right? This allows for shared control. We'll talk about some layers and like different types of shared control coming up. This does not necessarily mean a 50-50 um, equal split, right? But we'll talk about what that looks like. And sort of what happens, right, the byproduct is that we see the personal growth of young people and adults as we are learning to collaborate and work and listen, truly listen and dialogue with one another about what our systems and communities could look like. So blue is what we're going for, but we're also going to talk limitations and things in a bit that kind of maybe have us consider maybe green is where we end up or yellow in different circumstances. But blue is sort of where we'd like to be. Real quick, some benefits of youth engagement besides you get to eat a lot of pizza usually, um, right? Young people, when they're contributing to the designing and implementation of new policies, this changes your institutional culture and your practice, right? This will shift hopefully how we operate. That may sound scary and it is a lot of work and I don't know about anyone else, but I'm very bad at developing new habits overnight. Um, it takes a lot of practice and a lot of kind of releasing of failure. Like we're gonna learn through this, we're gonna work through this, we're gonna get there. Requires a little bit of this culture shift uh, to even start. We're gonna build awareness and common understanding with each other. This might lead to that common understanding, that being able to work one, with one another, maybe just not in our systems, but maybe in other community spaces. Um, the really cool thing about being supportive adult professionals and young people in our communities is that we exist outside of our jobs. And these relationships, right, carry over. It's not as though Shane and I only speak to each other at work. We do run into each other at events and things out in public. We live near each other. Um, we share resources and events and stuff. We have relationships outside of it. So you might see relationships beyond the workplace also grow as a result of that common understanding. Again, building that sense of community, build self-efficacy, again, not only for young people, but we see some of this in the support of adult professionals who are partnering and collaborating with the young people Maybe we learn how to ask questions in a different way or in a bunch of different ways because we know there's a bunch of different learning styles. Maybe we develop some patience. Maybe we learn to speak about our work in a way that isn't full of jargon and assumptions of what someone else might understand. We're able to really talk about our work in a way that's accessible and easily digestible, not just to young people again, but to folks all around us in our communities in our work. And again, it will improve individual and organizational outcomes. So again, that develops self-efficacy, 
increased uh, advocacy skills, increased interest in new and different areas of their lives, as well as your organizational goals. And we have some um, resources again from Third Sector Impact, the Center for Social, oh, Center for something that starts with S and then social policy, absolutely blanking on it, as well as youth.gov at the bottom here. So you'll be able to click on those when you get the slides. And so when we're talking about youth engagement, right? It's this, it's a bunch of strategies. It's a bunch, it's a strategy with a bunch of activities in it. And those activities can fall anywhere along what we call heart's ladder um, of youth involvement. The ladder analogy sometimes implies that like we always wanna get to the top but sometimes what you're fixing, especially if you're like five feet tall like I am, is not always at the top. Sometimes it's at the middle. Sometimes we just need to step up to get to a higher cabinet, right? I don't want folks to feel like because it's a ladder, you have to climb to the top all the time. There are limitations, there are realities, this takes time. One thing to note is that your program will have different parts of it, right? So my previous job at Youth New Massachusetts, there was a youth group that met every Tuesday and Thursday. They were largely self-sufficient, except technically I could not grant them the company credit card to order pizza. So the programmatic piece, absolutely at that one or two level, right, where we're youth initiated, youth shared decisions with adults and directed by young people, they're deciding their activities, they're supporting one another, they're using tools to plan trips and partnerships in the community. But this one thing around money and the budget kind of has to sit more down at level five, right? Where young people I might ask, hey, what's your budget this month for dinners? Um, what, what toppings would you like? Would you prefer I order from Wusta Pizza or Uncle Sam's? Wusta always wins, Uncle Sam's really gives us a hard time. Um, but you know, this idea of, because there's a limitation on the rules of the agency, don't allow me to hand you the credit card for you to see the statements we've got to partner in a different way. And the way you can identify the different types of partnership or different activities might be really paying attention to the verbs on this ladder. Um, so towards you know the lower rungs where we see manipulation, decoration, and tokenism, this is really where we don't want to be, right? This is symbolic representation. This is, oh, they said we had to have youth engagement. We got a young person here. They don't know what the heck's going on, but they're at the table. Let's check them off, those sorts of things. Once we start to climb up to six, five, four, three, et cetera, we start seeing these verbs that can be really helpful and not only the young people understanding what we're asking, but making sure that we are clear on what we're asking of young people and what we need to be doing to kind of on our end, meet them right where we're asking them to be. So assigned and informed level six, right? This might be where, for example, if you're working on outreach product projects, you might say, hey, this is the flyer um, you know, that we're developing for this youth program. Um, what kind of art do you guys want on it? Or do any of you want to find the art to go on it, right? They're assigned a task and they're informed by they're doing it. This is a flyer for the new program. We're doing outreach. Um, and that's that. This is okay sometimes, right? Because some young people maybe don't have a ton of time or maybe they're not interested in you know, level two and one work during final season, right? So sometimes we might see some flex, but that's kind of what assigned and informed looks like. It's like, here's this thing, this is why we're doing it. Level five, consulted and informed. Consulted's a little different than assigned in that you're asking for feedback once, twice, three times, and this requires a full loop of conversation, right? So here's the flyer. What do y'all like about it? What should we change? What's working? What's not? Here's the new draft. All right, now what do you like about this one? What do you not like about this one? What's gonna work, not work? And it comes back around. So consulting is more of a two-way kind of dialogue. And again, they're informed, so they know why they're doing it. Adult initiated, so this would be adults, um, supportive adult systems coming up with, um, you know, all right, we've gotta do this thing. We've gotta have a youth coordinator and youth involved in our CQI, our evaluation processes. That's the goal, right? That's the adult initiated goal. But how you get there is kind of this open thing, right? We can share some decisions with young people around what parts of the evaluative process do you think will need the most support and maybe what is going to come most naturally to y'all as young people. And so you can kind of partner and figure out what's going to work. Youth and adult initiated, this is when youth and adults are like, we're going to start up this program together. This will be great for the young people in our community, right? There's, there's mutual ownership of that initiation. We see youth initiated, they're sharing the decisions with adults as rung two. And then at the top, right, youth initiated and directed is when young people are in 
full control top to bottom, left to right of whatever project, organization, et cetera, uh, they're, they're a part of. So when you're thinking about how do I want young people to engage? What do I want them to do? Think about this latter end, your resources, your capacity, your goal, and make sure you're using clear, concise verbiage to communicate, hey, this is what we're asking of you. Uh, I don't think any of us like it when our jobs, our job descriptions are not very clear, makes me a little antsy. So I think, you know, we can, we can translate that to young people as well. On the next slide, um, I'm not going to sort of go over each of these boxes, but do you want to just say, here's another example of all these verbs and thinking about what can young people be doing that fulfills that verb, right? So if we're thinking about inform, again, they might tell you they like the website or not. Um, they might want to come to the open house and be told, you know, share their perspective on what the youth group is like or what the program is like. And as you kind of move to the right, we see us kind of creeping up that ladder a bit in terms of how much ownership and shared decision making sits with supportive adults and the young people themselves. The important thing to note across the bottom here is that we have our trauma-informed principles. So no matter what activity you all decide to engage young people in, right, or they decide to engage you in, in this work, we need to make sure that we're creating safety, both emotionally and physical, for the young people who are engaging with us and also staff who are doing this work. There has to be transparency and trust, again, within the cultural organization, as well as between those working with the young people. Young people have to be empowered, have choice, be able to collaborate. There's mutuality, right? Again, this doesn't necessarily mean equality. It means that we're both putting in and getting things out. The example I like to use is that uh, when you go to trainings, right, I'm putting in effort, you know, we developed the content, Shane and I were practicing, we're connecting with David and Leah to make sure we've got exactly what you all need. You all are attending and getting information out of it. But Shane and I also like to learn from you all and hear from you all what's working and not working. And so we're both putting things in and getting things out of this uh, informational exchange, but it's not the same things going in and out from each of us, right? That would be silly. If we all had the same exact stuff to offer the space and then we took the same stuff away, it'd be kind of a silly use of our time, right? We want this cross-sharing, this mutual piece. And then it's culturally responsive and there's peer support available, meaning that if you're doing youth engagement and you're doing it in a trauma-informed way, you're not just having one young person alone doing any of this work, right? They have the capacity and the ability and the access to work with other young people, to have someone who's got a shared experience, to be able to vent about the frustrations, to celebrate successes, to brainstorm with. Um, if any of y'all have ever been the only one of your role at an organization, you can imagine why this one is so important, right? It stinks to feel like you're alone in any hard work. Uh, so when we think about youth engagement, we've thought about it kind of on a ladder, and now we're going to sort of think of it in terms of levels. It's a very fourth dimensional thing, youth engagement. Thank you for sticking with us. There's a lot of different levels that these happen at. Um, for you all, it will likely be right at your local implementation sites level, possibly state, maybe some more local, right? Um, and then there's these national opportunities where we're all coming together uh, to, to talk across those state lines. Uh, Thanks. So... Again, not gonna go through all of them. They are very uh, self-explanatory and they're right here on the slide, but we wanna make sure that one, for those of you working at state um, or national or like county agencies, the limitations and things where you can end up on that ladder, you know, with different programs or whatnot is gonna maybe deal with, be a little bit different than it was for me at Youth Move Mass, where I had a lot of, uh, you know, freedom to kind of do whatever, because there weren't a ton of rules and regulations like there are in federal and state government, right? Um, the peers I employed could be under 18, for example, but for peer support work uh, that's billable to Medicaid, employees have to be at least 18. So these kinds of limitations are things you want to think about and make sure you understand because one, uh, they're limitations. So if we don't check into them, we might be very disappointed later. But also knowing how and where young people um, can operate it decreases anxiety, knowing like, well, can I do this? Am I allowed to talk to this person? Uh, can we spend our money on, you know, fidgets or does it all have to be like marketing materials? If they don't know the limitations, it can kind of make us nervous thinking about, well, I don't know where the lines are. I don't know what I have control and don't have control over. I feel sort of stuck. We might freeze up or you might see young people have dreams as big as, you know, they can, which is terrific, but with the reality of state and federal uh, limitations, right? 
Sometimes those dreams aren't always possible or possible right away. And we need to understand these so we can communicate them to young people. Uh, this is true, I think, um, David, you mentioned before, across systems as well, right? So in um, different systems might have different rules around hiring, again, for example, whether or not you can hire someone with a different type of uh, criminal record, right? And so when we're looking for lived experience to join our work, that whatever led to that criminal charge being on their record could very well be the lived experience we want to bring that person on board for, right? And so thinking again about, okay, if we can't hire someone with a W-2, et cetera, whatever, for that role, can we offer a stipend for consultant work? Can that be a gift card? Can, you know, can we think about creative ways, one, to work within our limitations, but two, make sure that we are um, not breaking any super big rules um, as we go so we don't get, you know, don't, uh, jeopardize the project or jeopardize the agency of the work while we're making these changes. All right. We have a couple of really great resources for those of you in state and national settings um, or county, like with all those regulations types of limitations uh, that the federal assistant secretary for program evaluation uh, worked on specifically for you folks around youth engagement and those strategies with considering those limitations. So we'll make sure you have that before um, you depart. And then the last thing I just want to share is just a quick list. I'm not going to read through it again. Y'all will have the slides, but some pretty straightforward ways to improve the youth engagement process, both for you and the young people you will be engaging. So um, building relationships, gathering feedback, engaging multiple youth over time to provide diverse experiences, diverse perspectives. Shane's going to pick this up uh, in a second when talking about YMCI, but certainly um, we see often that we'll kind of rely on the same like superstar youth again, who came up and like maybe never had to be restrained or secluded in their residential or they got straight A's in high school or they, you know, did this big research project and they've been on podcasts or things. Those young people are terrific. Absolutely. But again, the folks who have sort of the not so superstar lived experience may also really be who we need on our team to help us understand well, what does everyone else need? What were your lived experiences like? Is this system working for everyone or just for the folks who are, you know, really good at being in high school and taking tests or et cetera? So on that note, I'm going to pass it back over to Shane to talk a little bit about our change initiative, which focuses on those um, kind of points around diversity and like what all young people need um, and what those specific considerations are for different populations. So Shane, take it away. Well, do uh, gladly. Thank you so much, Lydia. Um, and I understand that as, as part of this project that y'all are a part of, um, like underrepresented or historically marginalized populations are uh, an area of focus. Um, and I really wanted to take y'all through the journey that I um, experienced over the past year um, with our Youth Move Change Initiative, which was um, a project specifically focused on um, BIPOC and LGBTQ plus uh, youth and young adults with lived experience across systems. So uh, with that being said, just as an overview, uh, the Youth Move Change initi Initiative, uh, which we also call YMCI, uh, is a program that was designed to enhance and expand uh, the peer workforce with a specific intention to work in the field of mental health uh, to address the unique needs of youth of color and LGBTQ plus youth. I will say also um, that although um, the funding and sort of like the initial vision was, was to view it through that lens of the mental health system, it absolutely broadened and we had representation and input um, both from um, and, and, and like just referring to addressing um, like inner system experiences um, and identities. So um, as I said, in partnership um, with the Upswing Fund, actually, I'm not sure if I mentioned that, but um, thankfully we got uh, this grant funding from the Upswing Fund, which was is meant to sort of enhance um, the mental health field specifically. But thankfully, like I said, we had that freedom to kind of branch out and expand. Um, so this initiative was designed to mitigate systemic challenges and barriers to care, uh, reduce stigma around mental health and provide education to youth across the country. Uh, so with this project, Youth Move National created a youth leadership council, a fellowship program, and a training schedule to build the capacity of the youth peer workforce. So I'm going to take you through um, these like major three tiers um, of YMCI right now, starting with our Youth Leadership Council, or our YLC, um, which met once a month um, from May through August of last year. 
so our YLC was a team of six young leaders from across the country um, who again met monthly uh, to review and to provide feedback on all things YMCI. So this was sort of like our oversight, um, overarching body of young people um, informing every element of our uh, initiative. YLC members also participated in a focus group exploring challenges LGBTQ plus and BIPOC youth face within mental health programs. Uh, these discussions have contributed to the de development of resources to improve experiences with mental health programs for young people in these communities. Um, and I will say I'll, I'll sort of round out YMCI with a list of some of the resources that we created, um, which has been really exciting. So that's our Youth Leadership Council. Um, next is our peer fellowship program, which also ran last year from May through November. Um, YMCI launched a fellowship program that provided an opportunity for three LGBTQ plus and or BIPOC young leaders uh, to create and to lead projects to further inform the development of the youth peer workforce at all levels. So fellows met with uh, YMCI leadership weekly, individually, and as a group uh, to further develop their efforts and to provide ongoing implementation support. Uh, so some of the fellows' responsibilities included, uh, first and foremost, creating uh, actionable guidance to the field, um, as well as joining panels and presentations as subject matter experts, um, and facilitating focus groups for youth and young adults with lived experience. Um, these three fellows were a combination of Black, immigrant, and multiracial, um, also with representation across systems, um, and two disclosed LGBTQ plus identities. Um, we were um, thankful to be able to offer $35,000 um, to each fellow for their time and commitment to this project. And that's not um, part of like their budget for resources materials. We had um, additional funding for that. This was exclusively as compensation for their time and their efforts, which was awesome. Um, so these are uh, our three wonderful fellows, or were, as our program did recently close out. So we have Amara Ifeji, Nakaya Lynch, uh, and Louis Gasper. Each one of them focused on a particular area of the youth peer support workforce to create final projects that would provide that actionable guidance to the field. So Amara focused on future financing options for this work, Nakaya on state and agency level readiness to implement this work, uh, and Louie on workforce development and training. And each one of them, I will say, created some fabulous final projects that we look forward to sharing out soon. So stay tuned uh, on that front. Uh, and finally, the last like major tier of YMCI was our Peer Connects training series. Uh, Lydia, you know it, it was a wild and eventful summer, training on training on training, <laughs> but it was awesome um, and, and, and super exciting. Um, and that was, uh, I think I said already last summer. So last summer, uh, Youth Move National piloted um, our like semi-newly finalized youth peer support curriculum uh, through this series. So uh, we were fortunate to be able to partner with six states across the U.S. for five cohorts. Uh, and those states included Oklahoma, California, Maine, uh, Flor I'm sorry, Utah, and South Carolina. Uh, Within each state, we identified community partners um, that included some youth move chapters to lead outreach and recruitment efforts at the local level. Uh, the YMN team also developed marketing materials, applications for potential training participants, uh, and hosted meetings providing support and welcoming feedback from each of these partner sites. Uh, and through all of these efforts, we made sure um, to emphasize that this training series was exclusively for um, young people who identify as LGBTQ plus and or BIPOC youth. Um, and uh, recruitment went really well. Uh, YMCI received 105 applications for this Peer Connect training. Uh, and during the grant cycle, we were able to train 62 youth and young adults um, as youth peer support providers in our curriculum. Um, and as you can see on the slide here, this opportunity provided peer-to-peer -peer learning and networking opportunities for youth across the country, um, additional coaching opportunities. Um, and thankfully we were able to compensate all training participants who completed the curriculum as well um, with a $1,000 stipend, um, which was really, really awesome. 
Uh, I will say as well that in addition to these three main pieces, YMCI was also fortunate enough to be able to host a large virtual gathering, um, which was our youth summit uh, or our summit for youth advocates. So um, we hosted that virtual summit uh, last year on November 13th. This was an event um, similar to our other efforts designed exclusively for BIPOC and or LGBTQ plus youth advocates uh, and youth le leaders between the ages of 16 and 29 uh, to join an intentional space to generate strategies and solutions for improving youth peer services within their communities. Uh, the summit started with a powerful conversation with the keynote speaker, Blair Imani, uh, which was followed by breakout workshops on radical self-care. Participants and facilitators then joined listening sessions where participants were invited to share their thoughts, feelings, and considerations on what it means to be an LGBTQ plus and or BIPOC young person navigating diverse and intersecting experiences and identities, as well as moving across these systems um, that we highlight. And through these conversations, we learned about the value of youth peer support, the barriers young people experience when accessing mental health services and supports, and what structural and policy changes are needed to better support um, youth in these communities. Uh, after that, we had our second and final keynote from Ashley Marie Preston, who was brilliant, uh, followed by a drag performance uh, that highlighted LGBTQ plus and BIPOC performers to close out our event. Um, and I will say, I always have to spotlight this now. I'm like the biggest fan of this profession and craft. Um, as you can see here on the slide, this is just one of the many graphic illustrations that were created throughout the duration of the event. Um, and I will say it it was only um, upon joining Youth Move National that I even became aware of, of this as a profession, um, but it is so, so brilliant. So as you can see, um, graphic facilitators, they also call themselves graphic note takers, literally provide um, like in real time during the conversation an illustration um, of conversations and events in such a dynamic and captivating way. So I will encourage y'all if you have any focus group conversations, live events, especially opportunities where you're seeking feedback um, to, to consult with a graphic note taker because it provides such an awesome compliment to any kind of like super wordy uh, report or product that you might pull out of a conversation like that. Um, so definitely wanted to make sure to highlight that this person actually went through sort of all of the, the recordings, conversations, um, and graphic illustrations within each like individual workshop and grouping and, and made it into like, this is the in event in its entirety on a page, um, which again is just really super sweet. Um, so uh, as promised, I'll end with a brief overview of the resources that emerged throughout this initiative so far, all of which can be found on our website there, youthmovenational.org slash youth-move-change-initiatives. I move around a lot. <laughs> Um, so our largest resource that has come out of YMCI so far is our online coaching and professional development portal. So this is a platform not only accessible to graduates of our Peer Connects training series, but for any person interested in exploring more about these topics. Um, the portal contains a series of videos, activities, information, uh, and discussion topics across these 10 areas of interest that emerged throughout the initiative. Again, you can find those on our website. Um, this is like the more specific link going to this page, but you can find it on that sort of surface level YMCI page as well. Um, and I also want to highlight um, that we have um, our, our, our two keynote conversations from our summit as part of this coaching series as well, which is super exciting. Um, so if you or any young person in your community is interested in exploring one of these topics further, absolutely feel free to direct them to our website. And then the last uh, more specific resource I'm going to highlight are our two uh, What Helps, What Harms tip sheets. So uh, in July of last year, YMCI began facilitating a series of focus group conversations with youth and young adults across the U.S. utilizing what we call uh, the What Helps, What Harms discussion framework. Uh, a primary objective in this process is to utilize these conversations held to produce a document with best practices to drive meaningful change. Uh, so as I said, through YMCI, we were able to create two What Helps, What Harms tip sheets from our focus group conversations 
uh, with some considerations for what is both most helpful and most harmful for youth in each of these communities in accessing specifically mental health services. Um, again, you can also find these on our website. And just to, to recap that, um, if you're looking to check out all things that have been um, published externally uh, regarding YMCI, you can check out our website. Uh, and we also have an email address if you're looking to reach out um, to us as an initiative directly um, or sort of anything regarding work specifically focused on serving um, BIPOC and LGBTQ plus youth, especially like in a sort of lived experience, youth voice, peer support focused capacity. Awesome. <laughs> Passing it back to you, Lydia. All right. Um... So we've thrown a lot of information at you for 45 minutes. Um, and so we're gonna talk about a couple of tools we have. Again, that we'll provide via email. They're on the website. Um, our emails are just our first name at youthmovenational.org. If you can't find them, David knows where to find us. Leah knows where to find us. So if you need these things, please let us know. But the first thing we'd like to talk about um, is the YVAL and YVOKE. These are two um, tools that are that have been designed in collaboration with our Youth Best Practice Committee, as well as Portland State University, to actually measure um, youth voice at your agency level, so the YVAL, or on your council and, or committee, so the YVOC. First off, um, just to know the background, right, this was a need identified by our Youth Best Practice Committee, so by young people um, and different supportive adult partners who said, like, it's great that we talk a lot about youth engagement, but like how do folks measure it? Because data and research really helps us get money, which is really important for doing important work. So how can we start quantifying the qualitative kind of in a way? And this was a tool that we developed um, and validated again, along with Portland State University. We wanna make sure that you understand what sorts of resources, commitments are required. Um, we don't want you to reinvent another wheel again. And it's a, it's a very supportive way to develop um, a tailored and like data-driven uh, way of thinking about what do we need to work on? What are we kind of all set on? How are we gonna identify our goals? What's low-hanging fruit? What's a long-term thing we need to think about? Helps us paint this picture so we can plan accurately. Again, the YVAL and the YVOC um, provide frameworks of key indicators and metrics so that you can kind of see not only at your baseline, right, like what does this growth look like over time? What are our youth engagement strategies actually leading to? Uh, Shane, we can go to the next slide. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Um, right, we're going to uh, think about how we can collectively reflect on our practices, our behaviors, our beliefs and values as an organization, as teams within that organization, and really think about um, how can we promote this shared vision for success, right? We're going to share not only what success like looks like, but how we define it with young people, right? What does that look like to each of us? Uh, it'll help identify strengths and needs. Um, and again, we're really looking to support y'all moving towards sustainable engagement. Takes a lot of work, takes time, takes effort. Want to make sure that this is sustainable over time. Um, and again, certainly can help us understand what y'all need. So when you give us a call, we can jump in um, and support you right where it's needed. The themes of the YVAL, there's eight of them. So these are um, themes that there's a series of questions and then a Likert scale. I'll show you what that looks like in a second. But these are the eight themes that we, we measure, right? So overall vision and commitment, collaborative approach, empowered representatives, commitment to facilitation and support, workforce development, participation in developing programs and policies, participation and evaluation, leading initiatives and projects. Each of these speaks to one, have we got policies in place? What are our practices like? Uh, what's our feedback in this area? How do we get that feedback? How do we communicate the changes or not changes back to the young people we're working with? What do staff in the agency or folks in the community need to know, understand, and be able to do in order to fully um, you know, engage young people and have this youth voice at the agency level? So it'll go through all those sorts of things with each um, participant. The YVOC covers four of these themes, and it's the first four. Overall vision through the commitment and uh, to facilitation and support. This was a tool that um, we're in the process of validating. The YVAL is fully validated, and we can provide that research if requested. The YVOC we're in the process of. But the idea being that sometimes large organizations are doing youth work in a smaller, 
uh, like program sort of, or like they have an advisory committee or there's, you know, a smaller body of folks working on that work. Um, we wanna make sure that youth are fully participatory and engaged and viewed as collaborators on that council or committee as well. And so when we take responses, um, each section, each domain, each theme has a different number of questions in them, right? But we'll ask you to fill out on a Likert scale, is this not very developed at all yet? Or is this fully developed, implemented, looks beautiful, right? Um, and so each question we ask for a one through five or an NA if it's not applicable to, to the work. When you receive data back, right, um, with the YVAL, you, the agency providing the, the, the filling out the YVAL, those scores are often compared to the validation study, the national sort of average. Not to kind of like inspire competition, right, but to sort of get an idea of where are things nationally with the group, um, where could we be, like what, what might that look like. Um, so in the chart on the slide, right, the red dot is where this group scored and the blue dot is the, um, the national validated cohort, right? And so an area of strength in their collaborative approach theme is this 2B, respectful partnering. Are young people valued as full partners, collaborators in the work, et cetera? Um, where there's an opportunity for growth, right, someplace we could really maybe improve or develop new things, might be around uh, 2E, right at the bottom in that list, the transparent decision making. So what kind of policies, processes, decisions, communication loops, means, et cetera, what all of that goes into transparent decision making and can we improve any of those? Can we streamline any of them? Can we adapt to TikTok or Instagram? Um, I cannot adapt to TikTok, but Instagram we've got. Uh, so, you know, thinking about how can we increase that transparency? In order to um, use the YVAL to implement it, right, this tool is free and it is available on our website. Um, we ask folks to just let us know either via the website or emailing info at Youth Move National, like, hey, I'd love a copy of the YVAL. The YVAL is available in English and Spanish. Um, the reason we ask you to let us know you're using it is because we just sort of want to judge our impact and reach who's using it, where, those kinds of things. Uh, agencies are welcome to use the YVAL on their own. If you have your own in-house um, data people, certainly take it and run. We would be thrilled. Uh, Youth Move National can also support with the implementation of that assessment. Uh, we administer the survey. Everyone gets their own um, individual link. We track the participation, send reminders, all that kind of stuff. But you would need at least 15 people to take the survey. These are people um, who are supportive adults working in the agency from your reception to custodial staff, to clinicians, to admin, to, I don't know, anyone else who's in the agency organization, right? Youth and young adults who are receiving services, youth or young adults who have in the past, youth or young adults um, who have siblings or families involved with those services, right? They can come kind of from everywhere around the organization agency because we want to get a feel from multiple, uh, multiple perspectives What's youth voice sounding like here? Um, da, 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 da. And then at the end um, of that piece, we write up a report. You would receive tailored resources and TA around areas um, that are available for growth. Also some support like, hey, this is what you're good at. What are you doing over here that we can transfer or translate to other parts of this work? Um, and so those are kind of the two options, requested for free. Um, absolutely take it back and use your own in-house folks um, to do that, to do all the math, which you don't, uh, which I'm not strong at. We have other people on our team who do the math here. Um, but then, you know, you can also contact uh, us and we will certainly support that effort. So I'm going to pause and just remind folks, if you have questions so far, to pop them in the chat if you'd like, um, you know, or hold them to the end. We have some time for questions. I'm going to talk a little bit about virtual engagement. Uh, and then as well as like the crisis continuum and considerations for 988 implementation coming sort of from this youth perspective. And then we have a slide of resources and then I think some Q&A time. So if you have questions now about sort of the youth engagement stuff, please feel free to, to drop that. So when we're thinking about virtual engagement, if you're still typing your question, that's A-okay. 
Virtual engagement, right? Um, these are sort of the things that come up in conversation over and over again with our Youth Best Practice Committee, with young people across the country, various sites that we're working with. Um, number one thing is that virtual options mean increased accessibility. This is increased accessibility for folks with um, who are in you know, rural areas who maybe don't have access to public transportation or even Uber or Lyft or like an Uber or Lyft from a rural area can be really expensive, um, those sorts of things. So accessibility in terms of who can be there and then also accessibility for folks who are deaf or hard of hearing, right? We have captions right now. Um, folks who have either anxiety or other mental health or behavioral health needs that make going out into the world challenging, right? Um, it could also increase accessibility for folks uh, like myself who are neurodivergent, who need subtitles to really benefit from like spoken um, work, like words and conversation. So thinking about accessibility, right? Recognizing too that during COVID, we've kind of all shifted to virtual and now there's a lot of language around, well, we're gonna return to normal. We're gonna return to in-person. And while um, I mean, I'm like the loudest, most extroverted person on this team, I am so excited to see other people in real life. However, there isn't any actual returning to normal at this point, right? And we all know how to use Zoom. Young people are much more familiar with it. Virtual can be an, a very valuable addition to or in conjunction with in-person activities, right? There's no reason why we have to toss virtual out the window because you know um, we're shifting back to being in person, either in our states, communities, et cetera. Consider keeping virtual um, as an added option. Virtual also has some limitations, right? It's not all rainbows on Zoom. Um, there's a lot of challenge for folks who do really process and learn best kinesthetically by doing, who are in person with others. Um, there's also some real safety uh, limitations. When I'm in a room training for youth peer support, if Shane and I are there in person and someone steps out, I can kind of step into the hallway and see did that person go to the restroom or are they in the hallway crying? I can't do that if someone shuts off their camera in a Zoom training, right? And so adjusting activities, um, we shifted a lot of the vignettes and a lot of the scenarios that we wrote to be much more um, sort of generalizable for our online training so that we could get into detail in conversation and kind of monitor how that goes rather than sort of maybe putting something heavy on the group at the beginning. We have to think about practices such as we have a thumbs up, thumbs down tool. Hey, if you're going to get up during this section on trauma informed, um, you know, and go take a break, that's great. But can you just give me a thumbs up emoji reaction so I know that you're safe and doing okay? Please give me a thumbs down if you'd like someone to check in with you. If you don't give me any thumbs at all, I'm going to check in with you via text in five minutes. So kind of just developing these new creative ways to maintain safety, to keep each other um, in the space, in the space well but really being cognizant of that. Some resources we have for you. Um, we have a great blog with a bunch of more resources, but also some firsthand uh, uh, pieces around facilitating virtual meetings that are youth engaged in and youth friendly. And I mean, honestly, I prefer meetings that are more engaged and friendly. <laughs> so I think, you know, a lot of us would appreciate that. Uh, a tool I use a lot is the book, Great Meetings, Great Results. It's um, out of a couple of professors at the University of Southern Maine, but it's very straightforward. Um, facilitation strategies, tools to use. And these are very adaptable and I found very easy for young people to learn. Facilitation as a skill, facilitation in a Zoom space is like a skill times a lot, um, right? So thinking about, can we practice these? Can we look at, you know, what is my goal with this conversation? How do I need to adapt things to virtual? There are lots of tools like Miro and Mural. I think I heard someone say earlier that they're like a real flip chart person. This might be from one of my other trainings. I'm sorry, they're all blurring together today. But for those of us who really like drawing with markers on big post-its, um, there's Miro and Mural that can mimic that really well. Menti for uh, polls, Kahoot, um, which is actually for educators, but you can like create fun quizzes. This is how we do a lot of our assessing um, at the end of trainings, for example. And then of course, using something like the whiteboard tool in Zoom, right? Um, and again, this mindfulness about adapt, adapting activities to virtual and hybrid when possible. What are the safety concerns? What is the goal? Um, you know, can we use breakout rooms, that sort of stuff. So finally, now when we're looking at the crisis continuum and these considerations for 988, um, Shane, there's a lot of clicking on this next one. So thanks for sticking with me through it all. Um, the first thing we wanna think about is 
like this, this story of young people going into crisis, right? This process, um, it will be different in each community. I know in every state, county, et cetera, depending on what services and things are available. But here's some of the like major thoughts that came up as Shane and I were talking about um, what this might look like. So the first thing that happens, right, is a young person reaches out. This might be through the crisis text line. This could be through 911, 988. This could be them texting you personally, right? Um, at this point where you might see youth peer support, right, would be maybe prior to this moment, a youth peer provider, youth peer support has supported the skill building so that young person can text you, right, and ask for help. They know how to identify how they're feeling and what they might need. Um, this is where we see programs like Youth Move Mass and other community-based, um, very low barrier support being really important because that community-based and accessible youth peer support can be a protective measure, right? Um, so, hey, if I get the support to learn this skill earlier, I'm more likely to reach out for help. I'm more able to reach out for that help and start this, this, this process. So from reaching out, we kind of move over to this gray box of like, all right, there's an assessment that's gonna happen. There's gonna be some kind of response. We're gonna look at the situation. Youth peer support here, youth peer providers have a knack they're trained to, and because of our shared lived experience, can build rapport based in mutuality quick, not lightning fast. Like I'm not saying that it's it's instant, but I'm saying that if you're gonna send in, um, you know, an older psychiatrist and a youth peer provider, my bet is eight times out of 10, nine times out of 10, that youth peer provider is gonna have the mutual shared lived experience, just develop a connection. Um, especially for young people who have been harmed by systems and harmed by crisis response before. So keeping that in mind that that shared lived experience is a huge benefit. Youth peer support connection could increase trust in crisis support. So if a whole mobile crisis team comes out and the youth peer provider is able to sit and helpfully explain and ask questions and just be there with that young person in the moment while they're getting support and help from these, these additional professionals, that may increase how well, how much I trust those other professionals. If the youth peer provider is saying like, hey, Shane's a really great mental health provider. And I think like maybe we could talk to them together about what's going on. It might help build those bridges. Finally, youth peer support providers themselves, this is a really important consideration, right? Um, require specific things if they're going to be working in mobile crisis response or crisis response in this sort of part of this timeline. Um, we need to consider re-traumatization. We need to make sure that the employing agencies are trained on how to work with youth peer providers, not just adult or family peer providers. There are very specific considerations for youth peers. Um, and we need to make sure that there is a robust enough workforce, right, to kind of share this, this load, right? We know that crisis work is extremely heavy. It's extremely emotionally fraught. It's deeply important and deeply good work, but also just it, it, there's a lot to carry there. And so making sure that we're attending to that. So there's been a reach out for support, some kind of response and assessment. We've looked at the situation has happened. And now we're moving on to kind of what happens next um, in this yellow box, excuse me, uh, these on-site interactions, right? So if a mobile response is activated, youth peer support, again, can be first contact, right? They can text or call the young person or you know, get patched through while they're on the way. Um, connection from youth peer support can also be something when we move to the blue box to kind of help a warm handoff, right? To tie this to the next person. The last thing to consider with on-site interactions, and again, this will be important to consider with the limitations of your work, right? Is youth do not want a police response when they reach out for help. This is, I, I cannot think of a time that a young person has said, yes, please send the police um, to me. Uh, in my work, Shane's nodding in agreement. Uh, it is tough, it is tricky, right? But we do know that many cities in the 70s 80s had unarmed civilian responders who were uh, held often within police departments or safety complexes, right, who were able to go out and do this kind of work, you know, work that didn't necessarily involve um, like high risk of violent crime happening to anyone, right, folks who are in distress, folks who need support. So we know it's existed in the past and we can look back to those examples and we can really listen to young people now and what works, what is the most helpful, what has the best, what, what creates the best outcomes. So then we move to this blue box, which is sort of crisis has happened, on-site interaction has happened, referral to care. This might be young persons were sent um, right to a higher level of acuity, so the hospital. Um, there might be a referral to respite. There might be a referral to any other number of places. 
but that youth peer support provider can support that first visit to the hospital, right? Okay, I'm going to go with you and like, we'll make sure that, you know, you've got someone with you while going through this process, particularly if, again, a young person has never accessed that kind of care before, or if they've accessed it before and it's been harmful. Um, youth peer support can offer uh, young people just like reassurance and grounding through what I call the story sharing gauntlet, which is when you're in crisis, okay, I have to tell the person I called what's going on. Now I have to tell the first person they sent or that they had called me back what's going on and about me. And then I have to tell, well, if they send the police first, I have to explain to the cop what's going on. And then if they send mobile crisis, I have to explain to that psychiatrist or that family provider or that clinician what's going on. And then when I get referred, I'm gonna to have to tell my story again. This is very exhausting. Um, and is very, uh, can be re-traumatizing each time it has to happen. And so that peer provider can sit with them through that, can offer support through that story sharing process, um, might be able to carry some of that with them. You know, hey, I'll remember this detail or I'll remember this piece or I'll carry your self-care binder, you know, so you can drink the cup of water, whatever, can just be there with them in it. Finally, youth peer support can support warm handoff to services, programs, or another youth peer support provider. This is true in any of these boxes that youth peer providers can connect to one another, um, which will have some errors at the end to show you, but just the idea that, hey, you're gonna go to the hospital, you'll meet Paul when you get, when you get there. Who's Paul? What does he look like? Is he nice? Is he gonna say hi to me? Do I need to say hi to him? We're trying not to add a whole bunch of other concerns and fears on top of the crisis moment. So any warm handoffs that can happen, especially if technology can assist that, like, can we give Paul a video call before you go to the hospital so you've seen him and talked to him, et cetera. So whatever we can do there. And then finally, right, we have this transition piece. All right, crisis has kind of peaked. We've gotten the support we need. And now we're going to kind of shift back to, your, to what your regular day-to-day -day is, was, or what you'd like it to be. This is kind of where we see a lot of youth peer support now, right? Um, is goal setting, establishing natural supports in the community. There's peer connections, trying out new activities with one another, making sure you're good to go. This is where formal and informal youth peer support can work in tandem. So at Youth Move Massachusetts drop-in groups, I often had folks, uh, even I think Shane actually themselves, uh, as well as you know colleagues of Shane, come to youth group with someone new just to say like, hey, here's the new space. Um, so Shane working for a more uh, formal provider and myself working for an informal one, we can work together to kind of help fill those gaps, but also build bridges across them <laughs> so folks get to the next place safely. Another strategy we've seen um, in Massachusetts, I know, and in a few other locations, there's folks who fill roles called follow-alongs, which is a little silly of a title, but I'll go with silly over another acronym. Follow-alongs, right? So when a young person transitions out of that setting for care, there's someone who's checking up with them, you know, from their previous place of care. So there's this, this linkage, right? Um, so if I'm the follow along and Shane transitions, you know, back home after being at, I don't know, our program for a few weeks. Hey, Shane, how's it going? Like, I'll be in touch once or twice a week for the next six weeks while you get set up with all your new pieces and can help notice any gaps there. Again, we have all these warm handoffs recognizing that it is super nerve-wracking to go someplace new, find someone new, share your story again, etc. And then across the bottom again are our trauma-informed principles. All of those have to be present in order for these services to be, or these supports, these steps to be youth-friendly. And then also this idea of data and confidentiality concerns, data justice. Um, this is something sort of new to me as well as younger uh, youth advocates are coming up and saying like, okay, this all worked real well when y'all didn't have the internet and EHR all connected and all these things, it's electronic health records, sorry. Um, but now that everyone knows everything about me seemingly before I walk into a provider's room, who has my data? What is it doing there? When did I give permission for so-and-so to see it if I go to this doctor? Understanding that map and who has what information about me is a very, um, it's kind of like a new challenge that we're seeing and understanding that young people are concerned about who knows what about them. I think sometimes there's this very like uh, pervasive idea that because young people grew up on Facebook or they grew up on Twitter, that they put everything out in public. And that's not true, right? We know young people still want their own privacy and confidentiality respected and making sure that we're cognizant of that and sharing that information as we go. So if the person who arrives at the crisis point says, hey, you signed this release, that means 
your doctor, your psychiatrist, the ER doctor, et cetera, will be able to see these notes. And then when they get to their ER doctor, whomever, ER doctor says, okay, you signed these forms. So now these people can see it. Here's the full list. You know, how are we communicating those shifts and changes and where my information is? And what control do I have over who has what about me? All right. And then just to um, sort of touch on these considerations for youth support regarding 988, right? Um, again, this data justice and confidentiality piece, young people want to know where their data is, um, who has access to it, what people know about them before they walk into a room or a conversation, which Shane was sharing, um, largely around how specific populations have specific needs. This is true for support that happens over a phone as well, right? Um, considering what training or connection people who answer in the phone have across things like race, education, ability, disability, gender, sexuality, neurodiversity. All of these things affect how we relate, how we listen, how we help. And are we setting young people up when they use this tool to feel fully heard as their full authentic selves as much as possible, right? Um, a phenomenal example of this is working on a quality improvement center project with uh, for LGBTQ youth and foster care. By the third in-person meeting, um, the young people I was working with asked if they could get up and like address the room. And I, you know, we had our, our, our small space meeting and we sort of, they figured out what they wanted to share and they shared, you know, we're black LGBTQ youth. And so when we walk into a room and all of the local implementation site, all of the leadership is white with the exception of one county, right? If all the leadership is white, I don't feel I can be safe in this room as a person of color. So I can't be safe in this room as a black LGBTQ person. If, same thing um, if you have an office space and it's not accessible to folks who use mobility aids, right, such as wheelchairs or walkers. If you're an LGBTQ agency and you don't have a ramp, you're not actually able to help all LGBTQ people, just the folks who aren't disabled, just the LGBTQ folks who aren't disabled. And so knowing that young people feel the need and deserve to be their full selves and appreciated and valued and honored as such in spaces they enter, including this help-seeking tool. Um, are our trauma-informed principles in place? Cross-system response means cross, consider cross-system trauma. If 9 and 8 is going to be available to everyone, right, are folks trained in what harm by the child welfare system versus what juvenile uh, justice system might look like versus what if all the systems just didn't pick up your family and you were kind of stuck needing something and didn't get that need met? Um, really considering, are we doing the cross-training, cross-education? Are we understanding what these different folks, the language they might use to talk about they need, they have? Um, I know Shane and I have heard a lot of young people say, like, I'm so stressed out, I'm going to lose it. That's not exactly saying my mental health, I'm so depressed, I'm in this episode, blah, 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 I'm thinking about killing myself. What language are folks using to talk about their mental health, their well-being, et cetera. And is it the language we're familiar with or are we able to kind of translate across those lines? And again, thinking about our youth engagement practices at the beginning, where is the youth voice in the design, the development, the implementation, and the improvement of this tool, right? Um, where has that been missing? Are there places that we could, you know, either by using what helps, what harms, or even some of the tools, uh, other tools Shane was saying, um, help us inf influence, um, infuse, thank you, that's the word I wanted, infuse uh, this work with youth voice. One thing we think we might see some challenges with is that young people are very used to using things like the crisis text line or the okay to talk, which is the youth young adult tool from the suicide prevention, um, the Lifeline Suicide Prevention Group. And so if they're gonna be using a new tool, how do we, one, make that tool just as safe and comfortable and usable as the others, but also, are we as prepared for, for young people who are already using this, right? Like if, if I'm already using crisis text line, I really like how it's set up. And then, you know, I have a long wait one day and I need to use 988. Um, what's my experience gonna be like in relation to the other? And is it, is it um, smooth? Not necessarily is it the same, but again, are the trauma-informed values and uh, trauma-informed principles in place in both places? Is youth voice valued in both places? Are those sort of values and cultural pieces similar? Because um, that will really affect my experience with it. Really good example of um, a crisis line that's actually staffed by young people for young people is Teen Link. And I'm 
want to say it's out of Washington, but I can Google it, but it's a crisis line staffed by trained youth to answer calls from youth in crisis. Um, it is teamlink.org. And so that's one way that we can sort of, again, partner with local organizations, partner with youth who are already doing this work and ask like, what's been going well? What's been challenging? How, how, would, how do you envision this working? Um, there's a lot of cool opportunities for youth voice and youth engagement in all of this work. Um, and it is challenging and it is a lot of fun, but it really does result in a, a fuller experience, right? Whether that's a system or a, a tool or a product, right? It, it, it has a fuller um, set of perspectives involved. And that's, that's very valuable. Thanks so much for being here, Rebecca. Take care. And then finally, we have a list of resources. I know it's 316, so I'm not you know, gonna read them all, but these are all active links. So when you get the PDF, you can click on them. Um, and like I said, you know where to find us. So thank you uh, for listening to us talk so much at you for so long. And if you have any questions, we would so be open to hearing them and talking about them. Lydia and Shane, thank you so much. That's a lot to unpack. Um, yeah. but, but you know, I, I, what's, one of the things that struck me was the commonalities of so many other groups that we tried to give visibility to and try to say nothing about us without us. Uh, it's kind of the same products, many of the same protocols. Um, so uh, if anybody has a question, you can either do it in the chat, you can come off a of mute and ask it yourself. Uh, but if folks have any questions, comments, or thoughts for Shane and Lydia? David? Yeah, Jackie, I saw you come off of uh, your video. Do you have a question? I do. Did I, am I still on? Oh, sorry. There you go. Too. Sorry. <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah, I thank you for this um, awesome presentation. Um, I love you to move. I go way back with you move with Lacey and Brianna and Jamana. So I appreciate all of that. But I did see a link somewhere where we can ask for individual TA. And I know that's something that that um, yes. we would want to do in Mississippi. But I do have a question. Um, so we're trying to go back and revamp our peers, our young adult peer support specialists. We started off with our system of care site where that position was required. And we still we still have five system of care sites in the state. But because you know those young people are so transit, we um, our numbers are limited. So we start talking to our community mental health centers again about hiring um, young adult peers and we ran into a lot of barriers. You know, with the same ones that we had way back in the day, they too young, the ethical guidelines with the dual relationship. Sometimes the mental health center is requirement to be 21, some 25, they have to have a car and insurance, you know, all those barriers. So I would just like, um, y'all input on how have y'all addressed those um, issues and barriers? Totally. So uh, for a couple of those things, there I don't want to say simple policy changes because that's never simple. I would never mm -hmm. <laughs> that simple. But the thing like um, that youth peer providers have to have a car. Is this yeah. a place where HR would accept like you can be hired and then within six months obtain your license and a vehicle um, because we know in order to have a car, you need a job to pay for it. You need a car to get yeah. the job, you have to pay for it. Um, like, are there, are there ways that we can ask for some flexibility for either specifically youth peer providers or even the whole agency, right? Is it, if everyone's coming to the office to see uh, folks, for example, is it necessary? You know, could ask those questions too. Um, for things such as, you know, the, the turnover rates and pieces, um, we ask folks to consider not just their own agency, but like your wider ecosystem, right? Mm -hmm. um, when we work with states, for example, who uh, still um, have the federal minimum wage, Target's a real problem now. They start at 15 an hour. That right. is a challenge. Mm -hmm. So how can we help folks um, work with you all to identify where are the like points of flexibility that are a draw? Where are the opportunities for like some mentorship and like maybe you want to go to school for psychology, you want to become a case manager when you get older or a psychiatrist, therapist, how are we linking them into that work, right? Because that is super valuable to young people, yeah. particularly those in college. 
mm -hmm. um, flexible schedule, all those sorts of things, opportunities to go to trainings, like, and how do we get that on the job description so people see that and not just the compensation line, right? So how do we how do we phrase this as um, not only a way to get paid, which it certainly is, and we're absolutely all for working with you all to advocate for opening up those Medicaid plans, getting those reimbursement rates up, but also, right, how can we how can we draw young people in and and retain them in a way that like isn't just kind of fibbing about it, but is like genuinely these are cool opportunities that you don't get other places. Um, so certainly we can can talk about those pieces more in detail and kind of what other communities have done or what you know your own community has for strengths and, and assets in that area. Yeah, thank you. It's yeah, super we, multifaceted. Yeah, we have. Um, we're fortunate that we do have. Medicaid reimbursable um, services for peer support, but it is the lowest. <laughs> reimbursable oh yeah, no, rate. absolutely, mm -hmm. yeah. absolutely. And, and so, where else might we find funding? And also, Medicaid. Remember, we need to remember um, doesn't reimburse for all the activities that are core to youth peer, right? Like the group yeah. at work, um, you know, the story sharing stuff. A lot of that, um, the recreation stuff, that ends up being really important. Not all of that always is billable. And so, how do we? Outreach and that's a great example of partnering. Um, how do we how do we build in that money as well? Bladed, branded, bladed, branded. Oh my goodness, blended and braided funding yeah. <laughs> strategies like that. We have chapters and folks who do that work, um, and certainly would be happy to offer their perspective and things too. Okay, I have one more question. Yes, unless somebody else have one, then I'll say mine. <laughs> Jackie, since you got the floor, why don't you go ahead? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, so the other question is, have you all assisted any other states in maybe marketing efforts on the benefits of young adult peer support? And we're thinking about that um, as far as, you know, using our current young adult peer support, but um, we haven't thought it out. I see my supervisor on the line. She was probably like Jackie, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> so if you have any open, any suggestions for that as well, if y'all assist another state with that. I'm sorry, you cut out in the middle there for me. Was it, um, how do you market like the actual service? If, or okay. if you had assisted another state in a marketing campaign for the benefits of having a young adult peer as a staff member. So I don't know if I supported um, a state with like large mark, you know, blanket marketing, like this is the benefit of youth peer support. Mm -hmm. Certainly like targeted outreach and things. And when we talk mm -hmm. about both recruitment for the service and recruitment for the youth peer providers, how many times we get into this rut of like, well, I'll send a note out to all the clinicians and they'll refer people. But it turns out clinicians are like super busy all the time yeah. um, mm -hmm. and also overworked. Like, every, And so how do we um, reach out directly to those young people, like cafes, places where music is being played, um, live, whatever, libraries, other programs, um, and certainly how can we partner with schools and other mm -hmm. peer programs that might already exist. I think many times um, I see programs forget that again, young people besides having the mental health need they have and seeing that clinician are also really into, I don't know, rollerblading and they're also or skateboarding and they're also really excited about, I don't know, arts and crafts or something, right? So how can we reach out to the local skate park around, hey, this service is available. If you know anyone who's dealing with like tough mental health stuff or stress, mm -hmm. Like have them give us a call. Um, can our flyers like have a friendly screening process on them where it says, you know, instead of job description, and it's sort of a wall of text like, hey, we're looking for young adults who have been through some hard stuff and want to help out other youth going through the same thing. Give us a call and maybe you're the right person for this job or message us on Instagram, right? How can we yeah. bring folks in without the whole commitment of writing a cover letter, which is very daunting still to me these days. So um, certainly more the targeted reach for the recruitment, but not so much the blanket. Shane, have you had a different experience? Because I know with Zia, that was a large part of the work was like. I mean, it was a lot of what, what you just described, like putting out, putting our, our information out anywhere and everywhere. Um, I didn't allude to this, I think, when I introduced myself, but I previously worked at um, a youth and young adult drop-in center led by young people with lived experience, for people with lived experience, um, like just starting out. So we weren't visible <laughs> at all. So yeah, definitely like coffee shops, libraries, places with community boards, but also 
Um, it took a lot of steps and a lot of conversations to be able to get into the public schools in the city um, and have direct conversations with their counseling departments, guidance departments to, to give them our materials. Um, but it, it was pretty great um, and beneficial when we were able to get in there. I mean, I remember even having conversations in schools um, and having like young people walking through the hallways and the counselor pulling folks in and be like, hey, these people are great. Just hear about them as a resource. Um, so yeah, definitely that. I will say too, um, that it can be difficult in, in communities or organizations that don't actually have this work to sort of campaign and argue for the for the need for it to exist. Um, mm -hmm. And that's, that's definitely something that just like across any, any, I guess, environment, opportunity, event, conference, I mean, that, that we had an opportunity to sort of get that, that word in. Um, we've tried, but I, I definitely think too, that like, I don't know um, what the possibility is to like gauge members of, of uh, like, like a youth, engaging in services or receiving services and just sort of like describing what this role looks like and whether or not that would be beneficial, you know, like would, would you f feel um, that it would be valuable to have the opportunity to meet with someone who shares your direct experience and not only that, like it's part of their job to be able to share that with you um, because that's such a, a rare and unique thing with yeah. this role. Um, I remember before even hearing that the youth peer support or peer support in general existed, I thought like maybe I'll give a wink or a little like you know, like I see you because I've been there and relay that in like the most subtle way because I had heard that um, in many, many positions it's frowned upon or like completely for, forbidden to, to relay your lived experience. So I think really like getting at those those young people that would benefit from that kind of work and saying like, hey, like <laughs> talk talk to this organization and, and let them know that this is what you're looking for. Um, but it definitely can be difficult. And I think even um, in spaces where this work is implemented, it can be hard to argue the value and importance of it as well. Um, so just feel free you <laughs> on that front for sure. Yeah, I was thinking and then another target audience would be the mental health centers and the providers themselves. Mm -hmm. Those who have been resistant to hiring um, mm -hmm. young adults, um, yeah. the benefits of hiring them as well. Thank you all. For those folks, so good. Yeah, and for those folks, particularly like champions in your systems are important. So the folks who have real serious power, one or two of them who are like, we're going to do this. Youth care support's important, et cetera. Um, David, I see you've come off mute, so I'm going to have you jump in. Go ahead. No, I, I was just going to say that this is, that's exactly it. I mean, you know, at the state level, you know, you're sort of the cheerleader. You're, you're really, you know, promoting best practice. Uh, it's really at the provider level, the organizational level where you see it. And, you know, like other groups, I mean, for how long did, you know, you, every state had, you know, the providers that, st that, that st did what they wanted, to, they stood up and did what they, they were supposed to do because it was best for what they, were, what, what they were practicing and the best for the outcomes. We always had the providers that would drag their feet. And so, you know, any other types of examples of how you've seen states authorities be able to better champion getting it at that level um I, I i know folks will be all ears because i mean that's that's the thing it's uh promoting it um but then you know getting getting the providers to actually embrace it and, and implement it absolutely thank you uh definitely and one thing too we've done a lot of work with um, many of the quality improvement centers again mostly in child welfare circles is also understanding like that real burden that folks on the ground are under, right? Like there's initiative fatigue, every, you know, mm -hmm. very rarely do we get money without new deliverables attached to it, um, all of those sorts of things. So it has to be as easy, efficient, built into the day-to-day -day processes as possible. And that, that takes a lot of communication from those champions and from the technical systems people and the people making the changes with those folks on the ground, um, just like what's wearing you out, what things do you do automatically? And, building it into to those pieces is, it's tough, but definitely doable. And we have some great state folks, I'm sure, who'd be, you know, would love to offer what's worked for them and happy to connect. Well, and, you know, and this is, this is a, a big step forward, big time today. Mm -hmm. um, I think those of you see that Ava put the link back in, into the chat earlier, we'll probably also put it out on the TTI listserv or may send it out individually to, to this group. Uh, but Shane, Lydia, thank you so much, not only for today's presentation and your expertise, uh, but for the work that you're going to be doing with us the next few months. We look forward to it. We're and super I, excited. Yeah. So thank you again. And everybody, have a great week. Enjoy, you know, your hopefully springtime weather where you are. And we will catch you soon.
Take care, everybody. Thanks so much, everyone. Bye-bye.